Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 2021 National Committee on American Foreign Policy Gala. I'm Jacqueline Adams, and I'm delighted to be your host for this 47th annual gala, your second virtual gala. Sadly, yes, tonight's gala organizers remain cautious about assembling in person, but they have planned an exciting and thought-provoking evening for you, and with no event overhead costs, the full dollar amount of your participation will benefit the organization directly. In case you're wondering about my foreign policy credentials and why I am hosting you again, um, I serve on the International Advisory Board of the U.S. Institute of Peace and I'm a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. I spent almost a decade on the board and two years as chair of the Off the Record Lecture Series of the Foreign Policy Association, and I reported on major foreign policy topics during five years as a White House correspondent for CBS News during the Reagan and Bush 41 administrations. Like so many of you, I have experience with a number of nonprofit organizations, and I've observed that the past two years have demanded agility, creativity, and patience from all of us as we have adjusted to the evolving levels of threats from the pandemic. This evening, you will learn that the National Committee staff has been extraordinarily nimble and has responded to the health and economic crises by increasing their capacity to conduct virtual track two discussions, as well as numerous public and private programs. Their creativity is reflected in their selection of the three outstanding leaders whom we will honor tonight for their contributions to national security, peace, and preparing the next generation of leaders. You can look forward to being inspired by the award recipients tonight, of course, but also by the individuals selected to bestow the 21st Century Leader Award, the William J. Flynn Initiative for Peace Award, and the George F. Kennan Award for Distinguished Public Service. The speeches tonight are deliberately brief, but you will be able to experience the breadth of our winner's expertise in a series of interviews that we have and will videotape. You can find our Women in Foreign Policy discussion by clicking on the YouTube icon at the top of the National Committee's website or by searching for the National Committee on Foreign Policy's YouTube channel. Our interview about peace in Northern Ireland should be live at the end of this week. To launch our evening is the architect of tonight's gala, Ambassador Susan Elliott, President and CEO of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy since 2018. An accomplished diplomat, Dr. Elliott spent 27 years at the State Department, including service as the U.S. Ambassador to Tajikistan and as Deputy Executive Secretary and Director of the Executive Secretariat staff under Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. She will frame tonight's program and explain why the National Committee deserves your support. Susan. Thank you, Jackie, for that warm introduction. First, I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening to honor three outstanding individuals, Lauren Buta, Admiral Michelle Howard, and Sean Kelly. Their phenomenal accomplishments exemplify courage, perseverance, hard work, innovation, and dedication to government and community service. As most of you know, Hans Morgenthau founded the National Committee on American Foreign Policy in 1974. The mission and activities of the National Committee have evolved over the years, but our dedication to strengthening U.S. security and resolving conflicts that threaten U.S. interests around the world has not changed. During last year's gala, I highlighted how the pandemic created serious challenges for the National Committee's leadership and staff. Those challenges remain, but we continue to develop innovative ways to conduct our activities. Given the success we have had over the past year with our virtual Track 2 discussions and public and private programs, we have decided that even when the pandemic is behind us, we will continue to supplement our in-person activities with virtual discussions and programs. In 2021, we had a really productive year. We expanded our public programs and they covered a wide variety of in-depth discussions on U.S. foreign policy issues, including Northern Ireland, 
Afghanistan, Kazakhstan, Iran, Africa, U.S.-China relations, EU-China relations, the Korean pen Peninsula, and women in foreign policy. We also began new programs focused on developing the next generation of emerging leaders and are about to implement new projects on multilateralism and how disinformation affects foreign policy decisions. In order to maintain the quality of our work and develop these new programs, we need continuing strong support from generous donors like all of you. Tonight, I ask that you consider expanding your support of the NCAFP. We have provided links, which you will see on the right-hand side of your screen, and they will give you information about NCAFP membership, donations, and our social media programs. If you're not a member, I encourage you to join. Your membership will give you access to all our programs and reports. It's also the best way for you to be involved in the future expansion and creation of our activities. You may also want to consider making an extra contribution this evening. Every dollar that you contribute is 100% tax deductible and helps us to keep our diplomacy in action going. Over the years, generous support from our members and donors enabled us to begin important initiatives which led to the Irish peace process and the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Your support also enabled us to begin a dialogue on North Korea which led to the six party talks. Your generosity also continues to allow us to keep important lines of communication open between Beijing and Taipei. At a time when communication continues to be difficult and relations among countries are strained, the NCAFP provides a way for experts around the world to exchange ideas and make policy recommendations that we can share with our respective governments. This year's gala, gala is truly a celebration of the National Committee's historical legacy, current achievements, and exciting future. So I want to thank all of you again for making the important work of the NCAFP possible, and I look forward to a fantastic evening celebrating the achievements of our distinguished honorees. Since 1974, the National Committee on American Foreign Policy has provided a platform for dialogue and conflict resolution, and today our organization remains as committed as ever to keeping lines of communication open. From our robust public program to our extensive and historic Track 2 dialogues, we bring people together to build trust and resolve conflict. Let's take a minute to reflect on some of the highlights of the past year. Thank you very much, Ambassador Elliott. It's a great pleasure to be back here with the, with the NCAFP. Thanks to the National Committee on American Foreign Policy and to you, Ambassador uh, Thornton and uh, Ambassador Elliott as well for, for having me uh, as part of this uh, uh, distinguished panel. Is this Northern Ireland border issue and the trade issue, is that the big sticky wicket? I think the Europeans have used the term level playing field. They want to make sure that the British abide by some of the same rules when it comes to things like state aid, um, environment, I think, has come up from time to time as other European countries because they make the argument if we're going to give you special access, then you can't subsidize your companies because it gives a, a, a competitive advantage over ours. Great. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Dr. Vaughn. And it's great to uh, reconnect with uh, my colleagues um, on an all, all women panel, which is amazing and rarely happens. <laughs> so I'm very excited. Thank you so much. Thank you for the privilege of being with you and thanks for your leadership of an organization that I think is more important than ever. Uh, an organization that is that is found was founded by Hans Morgenthau uh, and and uh, I, I really feel a connection to him in some ways because in 1989 our cavalry regiment was was patrolling uh, the, the east west German border near his hometown of Coburg, Germany. The biggest part of it, in my view, though, is less cyber than the disinformation and influence campaigns, and we have to figure out how to do those. This is an important issue that's gonna to continue to evolve as, a, as a, a core foreign policy issue. So, you know, I encourage people to watch the space, and, and you know, I do think it's gonna get integrated into all the other policy issues we see. I think it's gonna gain greater prominence because so much depends on it in terms of our both economic well-being and social well-being, but just, you know, the international world. Thank you very much for that warm introduction. And it is uh, 
a great pleasure and a privilege and an honour uh, for me to have the opportunity to uh, speak to the National Committee on American Foreign Policy and also, of course, Yale. So I want to thank both you and your colleagues in the National Committee and also Bonnie and her colleagues in Yale for giving me this opportunity. Susan, I just didn't want the opportunity to pass without uh, expressing my thanks to the National Committee. Uh, the National Committee on American Foreign Policy has been engaged on this issue for decades uh, with good effect. And I also want to commend this kind of format of five. I think that track two, five party talk is very useful, but I think it's even perhaps time to think about the possibility of track one, five party talks. Just have to say, I feel so indebted uh, to, to the National Committee, uh, who sort of believed in me when I was right out of the PhD and uh, George and Don, you know, and John Connorton and the whole crew and Edie. Uh, so I'm, I'm really thrilled, uh, you know, 10 plus years later to be back in this capacity now that I'm over here in Korea. Welcome back and thank you, Susan. The video was a distillation of all that the National Committee has accomplished and is the perfect lead-in to the Chairman of the Board of Trustees, Jeffrey R. Schaefer. Jeff was Vice Chairman of Global Banking at Citigroup before launching a third or perhaps even a fourth career as Founder and Principal of J.R. Schaefer Insight and Chair of the Board of MDC IP Corporation, a fintech group. He serves as a member of the Management Board of S&P Global Ratings. In the 1990s, Jeff was Assistant Secretary and subsequently Undersecretary of the U.S. Treasury for International Affairs. Prior to that, he held a series of high-level positions at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, the Federal Reserve Board, and the Council of Economic Advisors. His public service career also included time as an officer with the 1st Infantry Division in Vietnam. Jeff? Thank you, Jackie. As the chairman of the National Committee, I want to welcome all of you, our friends and supporters, to this virtual gala. This is a wonderful evening for us as we recognize three people who have made important contributions to creating a safer world for all. They represent three communities, the NGO world, uniformed military, and business. The mission of the National Committee is to seek to further just what they have made their marks working on in their communities. The staff have pursued this mission in many ways with vigor and intelligence this past year under the leadership of the two Susans, our CEO, Susan Elliott, and the director of our Forum on Asia Pacific Security, Susan Thornton. Our track two or back channel discussions with the People's Republic of China and Taiwan have grown in significance as tensions between them have grown. We have re-engaged on Northern Ireland issues as Brexit has complicated the carrying out of the Good Friday Accords. And we have helped our members to understand important issues around the world. I would flag especially the discussion moderated by our board member, Carl Eikenberry, on the Afghanistan pullout. Our intention is to build on these activities and broaden them where there are important needs that we are equipped to respond to. Our Asia Pacific network is expanding and we hope to do more to address the regional issues that are intensifying there. Cybersecurity is an area where we believe we can contribute to building workable cooperation among countries. We've done a bit in this area in the past and I'm hopeful we'll be able to build on what we've done. With your continued support, along with the support we've received from foundations, we will be able to do these things. And I hope you will follow us during the year to gain perspective on global security issues. The best way to do this is through membership. If you're not currently a member, I encourage you to go to our website and join. You might also give a membership to a family member or friend during the coming holiday season. Members not only support our work, but they enrich our community. Thank you again for your support. And I'll turn the program back over to our wonderful host for the evening, Jackie Adams. Thank you, Jeff. 
Our first award tonight is the 21st Century Leader Award, and we are fortunate to have a past recipient with us to present it. Dr. Marissa Porges is an author, educator, aviator, and an advocate for women in national security. The title of her 2020 book explains it all, What Girls Need, How to Raise Bold, Courageous, and Resilient Women. Currently, she is the eighth head of school of the Baldwin School, a 130-year-old all-girls school outside Philadelphia that is renowned for academic excellence. Dr. Porges started her career on active duty with the U.S. Navy, flying jets off carriers as a naval flight officer on EA-6B prowlers. Ten years after the Navy first allowed women to fly jets into combat, she was launched off an aircraft carrier. She is, as we say, lettered up with a BA in geophysics from Harvard, a master's in science uh, from the London School of Economics, and a PhD in war studies from King's College London. Dr. Porges. It is my pleasure to be with you this evening to introduce the recipient of this year's National Committee on American Foreign Policy's 21st Century Leader Award. This award is a highlight of tonight's festivities because it honors not just past contributions and current work underway in the field of foreign policy, but recognizes the future potential of rising stars in the field of foreign affairs. Awardees are selected for their professional and personal accomplishments and join a cadre of other 21st century leaders, including past recipients Nicholas Thompson, Nate Fick, and Farhana Kazi. I'm a proud member of this group and so excited to welcome this year's National Committee on American Foreign Policy's newest 21st century leader, Lauren Buta, to the fold. Lauren is, of course, known as the visionary leader and founder of Girl Security, a nonprofit organization that prepares girls, women, and gender minorities for national security through specialized programs aimed at bolstering confidence and skill building skill building starting in high school. Girl Security works across the country to prepare historically underrepresented and underserved populations of girls for a future workforce that will face challenges in national security that require their leadership. Her vision of advancing equity in national security predates her work with Girl Security. She previously served as a fellow at the Carnegie Endowment of International Peace and the Truman National Security Project, among others, was a pol policy analyst for the National Strategy Forum, and while attending law school, launched her consulting forum to support clients on security and policy issues facing communities in Chicago. She has authored articles, reports, and book chapters on foreign policy and national security, and earlier this year was named one of the 50 Women Making the World a Better Place by Insile Magazine. Please join me in welcoming this year's recipient of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy's 21st Century Leader Award, Lauren Buta. I want to first thank Dr. Porges for her time and the National Committee on American Foreign Policy for this extremely humbling recognition. To be among a community of such distinguished prior winners is something I don't take for granted. I also want to congratulate Admiral Howard and Mr. Sean Kelly for their recognition and leadership as well. I also want to thank my parents for their tremendous sacrifices. My father began his career as a carpenter in Chicago after Vietnam, and my mother served as a nurse for many decades. They made tremendous sacrifices so that my four siblings and I could attend college, with my mother often explaining that when we spoke, she wanted people to listen. In my work at Girl Security, I certainly do more listening than I do speaking, but I did want to take a few moments to emphasize why I feel so passionately about empowering girls and national security. There are a few mental snapshots of memories from my own life that shaped the early concept for Girl Security. One memory is descending the escalator at the Siemens building in my hometown of Chicago, where I was working as a laborer during college summers to save money. As I reached the bottom platform, I was surrounded by women of all identities who were standing outside of a roped area of the construction site begging for a job. By that time, my dad had made it into the office with the suits, as he called them, and was able to put me on during summers to save money for college. 
their visible desperation for the sense of security that employment can provide is something that I think of every single day. And never before in my life at the age of 18 had the layers of privilege been so apparent. And in fact, today, women only remain at 10% of the construction workforce in the United States, which is roughly about one woman for every 100 people on a job site. A second memory is the sound of my mom's pain when she learned that my brother would be redeployed to Iraq after believing that he wouldn't. That pain was the sound of a mom who had felt that somehow she had gotten lucky and she wouldn't be so lucky a second time. And at that moment, nearly 20 years ago, I understood how personal national security is. It was around that same time that I was supporting women in Iraq who were working to start construction companies of their own. They wanted to lead, they wanted to contribute to reconstruction efforts, and they sought no credit. But once again, women were excluded by design from economic security and from the respective nation's security. I also think of moments from my own career as a national security policy analyst at a think tank when during poll months of my career, I was subject to some of the most egregious comments, conduct and actions. And despite all of the time that I had spent as the only woman on multiple job sites in construction in Chicago, my personal security had never felt as compromised as it had working in national security. Girl security is forging equity and national security by advancing girls, women, and gender minorities through supportive pathways. We're working to increase women's representation in national security. We're working to increase women's economic mobility into national security pathways. And we're also hoping to shape national security decisions that too often have a disparate impact on underrepresented communities, including girls and women. Every day I hear the stories of girls and women in our program, mentees or participants in our fellows program, or girls and women who are just interested in the work. Children of immigrants detained by ICE who are seeking to reform the immigration system. First generation students from Iraq who want to serve the country that provided safe haven and opportunity to their family, but who struggle with their own identity in this changing democracy. Those seeking a pathway to economic independence as an alternative to a pathway to marriage at 18. And those from my hometown of Chicago who have experienced levels of insecurity most can never conceive of. These aspiring national security professionals want to belong. At Girl Security, we want their insights and their experiences to matter and to be valued by the national security community. We also want policies and pathways to prioritize their workforce trajectory in this most important space. When I think of the words national security, I truly cannot imagine a more important space in which every single individual should feel that they belong, especially for girls and women who live lives every single day in which their physical, emotional, and economic security is never guaranteed and is often in peril. They are the ultimate security practitioners. I'm wearing my daughter's favorite earrings and thinking of my son, I do this work for them. And I want to thank them and my husband for their support as a mother starting a nonprofit, not the wisest choice. And I could not do the work nor be recognized in this capacity without them. And I also want to thank our mentors and mentees who show up every day to do the work of forging equity alongside girl security and national security. So thank you once again to the committee for this recognition. And I want to thank all of the girls and women out there in this space who make a choice every day to make the nation more secure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marissa. And let me add my congratulations to Lauren. I feel certain that in just a few years, we will be celebrating the accomplishments of the young women whom they are both currently inspiring. Next, I'm pleased to introduce Brendan McGuire, who will present the William J. Flynn Initiative for Peace Award. Brendan is an accomplished trial lawyer, litigator, and advisor in the areas of national security, cybersecurity, and privacy, export controls, and economic sanctions. He is a lecturer in law at Columbia University School of Law, where he teaches national security law. He also serves on the boards of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy, as well as the John Jay College Foundation. Brendan.
The National Committee on American Foreign Policy established the Initiative for Peace Award in 1997 to honor William J. Flynn, former chairman, president, and CEO of Mutual of America, and longtime chairman of the NCAFP Board of Trustees. Bill Flynn was committed to establishing and supporting the peace process in Northern Ireland. His decisive leadership and daring diplomacy laid the groundwork for the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. The NCAFP bestows this award to a community leader who, like Bill Flynn, has contributed to promoting and maintaining peace and stability in Northern Ireland. Former recipients of the award include the Honorable George J. Mitchell, the Right Honorable Dr. Marjorie Malam, the Honorable U. L. Carey, and Member of Parliament, Jerry Adams. This year's award goes to Sean Kelly, the former Global Chief Operating Officer of KPMG and the current chair of the company's Northern Ireland Advisory Board. Much like Bill Flynn, Sean has been and continues to be a thoughtful and impactful leader within the Irish community from New York to Belfast. He is also a dedicated humanitarian. Sean's leadership as chair of the Northern Ireland US Advisory Council for the East Coast, as well as his advocacy for Ireland Funds America and the Irish Arts Center in New York are a testament to his unwavering commitment to peaceful engagement and international cultural exchange within the Irish community and beyond. Sean has played an active role in promoting trade and business opportunities in Northern Ireland, believing that it is economic development that helps reduce violence by creating opportunities on both sides of the sectarian divide. A native of Belfast, Sean joined KPMG's Dublin office in 1980 and shortly after rose within the company. His leadership roles include vice chair of operations for KPMG LLP, vice chair in charge of KPMG's US tax practice and regional head of the Americas tax practice, serving as a member of the firm's management committee and a leader of KPMG's US and global transaction services practices and regional coordinating partner for the transaction services practice in the Americas. Since the tenure of Bill Flynn, Mutual of America Financial Group has been a longtime supporter of the NCAFP and has hosted its initiatives for more than 30 years by providing office space for the NCAFP staff and hosting the organization's track two dialogues and roundtables in the Mutual of America New York headquarters. We are so pleased to celebrate the legacy of William J. Flynn by presenting this year's award to Sean Kelly. Brandon, thank you so much for those kind words. And thanks to Jeffrey, all of the trustees at the National Committee, Susan and the whole team for this great honor. Uh, the National Committee does tremendous work around the globe dealing with conflicts and making our world a safer place and a more open place. And they've been doing this for over 40 years. So thank you for everything that you do. I also want to congratulate my fellow honorees, uh, Admiral Michelle Howard and Lauren Buta. Uh, you are tremendous leaders, role models and advocates, and I'm humbled to be honored along with you tonight. And thank you for everything that you do. Uh, receiving the William J. Flynn Initiative for Peace Award has very special meaning for me. Uh, I always had held Bill, Bill Flynn in the highest regard, not just for the success he had as a business person, but his active involvement in the peace process in Northern Ireland. The work he did along with other leading Irish Americans, such as uh, the late Tom Moran, Loretta Brennan Glucksman, John Connorton, was critically important in the peace process in the 90s, leading up to the Good Friday Agreement. His courage in, in engaging across the community in Northern Ireland was critical at the time to create the foundation that became the Good Friday Agreement. Um, and again, we all owe him a great debt of gratitude for, for what he did and what others did. The other thing that Bill Flynn did for me was 
identify and highlight the importance that business and economic development can play and the role it can play in resolving conflicts around the world. And that was a great lesson for me. And it was reinforced with me when I was working in Belfast in the 90s. I saw firsthand that when you were creating employment, creating opportunities, that addressed a lot of the social and political issues that underpinned some of the violence. And the investment in Northern Ireland at that time, particularly from the United States and United States businesses, was critical in establishing that peace and moving towards, um, the, uh, say, the Good Friday Agreement. Um, but I also saw firsthand how quickly that peace could be undermined if we didn't have economic stability and people were unsure about their economic future and the economic futures of their families. Uh, 1994 was a very busy year in the Kelly household. Uh, our youngest uh, child, Timothy, was born. Uh, my father at the time suffered a, a major aneurysm. And at that time, there was a 1% one, one uh, survival rate uh, for people who had the type of aneurysm that he had. He spent months in the intensive care unit in Belfast City Hospital, and we spent a lot of time visiting him. Uh, during that time, many of you might remember, it's something that's ingrained in Irish people from a sports standpoint. 1994 was the year of the World Cup in the United States. And on the 18th of June, I remember that date so well, Ireland played Italy in the Meadowlands and Ireland beat the mighty Italians, which was a shock at the time. Um, we all watched it back in Ireland. Had, uh, you know, obviously, great time watching that success. I remember heading back home and then about 2 a.m. in the morning, I got a phone call. No, no matter where you are in the world, a phone call at 2 a.m. is probably not a good thing. In Belfast at the time, you know, you knew it wasn't a good thing. Uh, but it was um, uh, Anne, who was the lead nurse in the intensive care unit where my father was. I'd got to know Anne very well. Her family had got to know her very well as her and her team had looked after her, her, you know, her father. Um, she had called to tell me that my father was moving out of the intensive care unit and into the high dependency unit. And he had been in the ICU for many months. So I said, well, that's great. He's making good progress. And said, well, no, Sean, sorry. We have to move him because we need the beds. And explained, and many of you were that night at the Heights Bar in Lockin Island. Um, attackers attacked the bar. Uh, people who were watching the World Cup, uh, innocent people. Uh, six people were killed. Five people were injured. And they needed the ICU beds for some of the injured. And that has stuck through me over the stuck with me over the years, for two reasons. One, I, I was always amazed and uh, in awe of the work that the, the folks in the ICU did to keep people alive, kept my father alive. And then you saw people who would take life so easily and treated it so cheaply. And at that stage, I vowed I would do whatever I could to make sure we never went back to those days in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland today is a very different place from. Six, the late 60s, early 70s, when we had really the, the worst of the troubles. It's very different from where it was in 1994. There's a vibrant modern economy there based on innovation, entrepreneurship, great opportunities across all sectors, healthcare, media, fintech, cyber. Uh, and because of that, and I think because of that success, the communities since the Great Friday Agreement have been working closely together. As I said earlier, uh, I, uh, I've learned that while economic development can support and help resolve conflict, if you don't have economic development, things go backwards very, very quickly. And, uh, and Northern Ireland is now facing a new set of challenges. The peace process that Bill Flynn was so instrumental in, along with others, including George Mitchell, uh, is, is facing some challenges, as are the people of Northern Ireland, the people of the whole island of Ireland. Coming out of the pandemic and the economic implications of that, the implications of Brexit, and I think many uh, of you would be aware of the issues surrounding the protocol and Northern Ireland's position uh, within the EU and GB because of Brexit. Those challenges are there and are very real, but there's also opportunity. The new, unique position that Northern Ireland has with access to GB and the European Union, I think creates opportunity. But the people of Northern Ireland and the people of the island of Ireland are gonna need, need help to address those 
And again, I think that's where business, and I think particularly U.S. business and the U.S. can play a critical role in helping deal with those issues so we do have a lasting peace and we can build a foundation uh, uh, for future prosperity on a shared island across all the communities. And I think there's a, say, a great role for uh, the United States, but also I think a great role for the National Committee um, building on the heritage that they have and addressing that. And I look forward to working with Susan, who is, again, uniquely positioned given her experience in Northern Ireland to help address the issues uh, that, that Northern Ireland is facing and the island of Ireland are facing over the next few years. Um, finally, uh, maybe not finally, but I would like to thank my family, my wife, Mary, my three daughters, Rachel, Natalie, and Lauren, and my son, Timothy. I think all of us know we could never achieve what we achieve in our, in our professional and business lives with the support of an understanding and patient uh, family. And I wanna thank them for everything they've done to support me. I'm not going to use the two words I know you've been waiting patiently for. In conclusion, I again want to congratulate uh, Admiral Howard and Lauren on their awards. They are outstanding leaders, outstanding women. And again, I'm honoured and privileged to be an honoree with them. And again, many thanks to Jeffrey, the trustees of the National Committee, Susan and all the te team for all that you do to make our world safer. And I look forward to another future 40 years of the National Committee playing a critical role in the world. So thank you again. Thank you so much for sharing your touching personal story, Sean. We need to be reminded that peace, economic stability, and diplomacy are more than intellectual concepts. They impact real people and real families. For our final award this evening, we will yet again personalize two national security icons. To present the George F. Kennan Award for Distinguished Public Service is his daughter, Grace Kennan Warnicke, author of the recently completed memoir, Daughter of the Cold War. Grace has had a multifaceted career as an NGO leader, foundation executive, small business development expert, writer, and photographer. She was a senior scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in 2013. She served as an executive for a series of economic empowerment organizations in Ukraine and Russia, as well as an international election monitor in Ukraine and Azerbaijan. Grace, it is a distinct honor to welcome you. Good evening to all. It is with great pleasure that I have the honor of presenting the George F. Kennan Award to Admiral Michelle Howard. Like George Kennan, Admiral Howard has devoted much of her life to public service. In her list of outstanding accomplishments, it is clear that she's often the first and has become notable for her achievements and for breaking so many barriers. She was the first woman to command a ship in the US Navy, the first African-American to become a four-star admiral in the US Navy, and the first woman to become the Vice Chief of Naval Operations. She served in operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. She also focused on cyber culture and information security in the digital age, as well as gender integration. While Admiral Howard and Ambassador George Kennan come from different generations and served in different eras, they shared some interests. Ambassador George Kennan all his life loved the sea. He owned several sailboats, and his greatest pleasure was sailing in the Norwegian waters near the Kennan family summer house. When he was 80, he traveled into New York from Princeton, New Jersey to take a course on celestial navigation. He would have been very impressed by Admiral Howard, who so often sailed in uncharted territories. I only regret that due to the pandemic, we could not do this ceremony live but hope that someday I will have the privilege of meeting our distinguished honoree. As a former chairman of the board of the National Committee and as a member of the Kennan family, it is with great pleasure to present the George Kennan Award to Admiral Michelle Howard. Thank you, National Committee on American Foreign Policy for this award. It is a particular honor when I think about 
the namesake, the Honorable George F. Kennan, a man considered by many historians as the greatest diplomat of the 20th century. Although the Honorable Mr. Kennan and I would both be considered national security experts, our tradecraft is different. We reside at the posing ends of the national security spectrum, cooperation for diplomats and conflict for warriors. But where Mr. Kennan and I meet is on American society. In his fulsome telegram, the statesman reminds us of the necessity of a strong America. He states, much depends on health and vigor of our society. This is the point at which domestic and foreign policies meet. Every courageous and incisive measure to solve internal problems of our society, to improve self-confidence, discipline, morale, and community spirit of our own people is a diplomatic victory over Moscow and worth a thousand diplomatic notes and joint communiques. His words are remarkably alive and relevant. We live in a time where domestic policy is international policy. We live in a time where our actions as individuals and collectively as citizens of the United States can have consequences on the world stage. Everything we do at home that engenders a society of confidence, discipline, morale, and community spirit does ensure diplomatic victory over our current competitors and underpins world peace. I accept this award on behalf of the military members who have served to ensure the prosperity of this nation and the happiness of our citizens. Thank you. What an extraordinary evening. Echoing Admiral Howard, tonight's gala has illuminated the connective tissue between the two ends of national security, cooperation for diplomats and conflict for warriors, as well as the blessings of a strong America. Let's give another round of applause to our award recipients, Lauren Buddha, Sean Kelly, and Admiral Michelle Howard, as well as to their presenters, Dr. Marissa Porges, Brendan McGuire, and Grace Kennan Warnicke. To hear more from our awardees, do visit the National Committee's YouTube channel. Just click on the YouTube icon at the top of the ncafp.org website. Our discussion of women in foreign policy with Admiral Howard and Lauren is there now, and my interview with Sean should be up by this weekend. To conclude our evening, let me turn the proceedings back to Ambassador Susan Elliott. Susan? Well, what a fantastic evening. Congratulations to our honorees and thanks to all of our viewers for supporting this year's virtual gala. We hope to see you at a future webinar, program, or track two dialogue, and hopefully it will be in person next year. So thank you again for supporting Diplomacy in Action.